Thank you. Well, we're most fortunate today to be able to welcome the Reverend Dr. Pierce J. Carefoot, Head of Rare Books and Special Collections at the Thomas Fisher Library uh, here at the U of T, if we have anybody from more distant places. And I say fortunate, not only because he graciously agreed to move his talk forward three weeks to accommodate a, a scheduling issue that we had with another speaker, but also because after giving a, a Wednesday lecture uh, a couple of years ago and subsequently uh, an exclusive on-site tour and introduction to the splendid Fisher Library collections, he has agreed for a third time to enlighten and engage us here at, at, at Senior College. Well, PJ holds a doctorate, as you may have read, in sacred theology from the Catholic University of Louvain and a Master of Information Studies degree from the U of T. He's also recently been awarded a doctor, an honorary doctor of divinity degree from Wycliffe College. Beyond the library, PJ is an ordained priest who serves in honorary and guest capacities at St. James Cathedral and other churches in the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. And I can say he's a very popular guest preacher. His principal research interests, books in the Middle Ages and, and Reformation, and the history of literary censorship are reflected in two books, Forbidden Fruit and Censored and Challenged Books from Dante to Harry Potter, and A Confusion of Printers, The Role of Print in the English Reformation. These, uh, in addition to several elegant and quite learned catalogs, to accompany some brilliant Fisher exhibitions that he has curated uh, over several years, such as Flickering of the Flame, Print in the Reformation, Great and Manifold, a Celebration of the Bible in English, Struggle and Story, Canada in Print, and perhaps most pertinent today, Nihil Obstat, an ex exhibition of banned, censored and challenged books in the West from 1491 to 2000. Well, for a rare books librarian, I think one of the most important challenges is to continually enrich the library's collections, a task which often entails competing in an international market for books that are in great demand, and often too requires inspiring um, support or enthusiasm among potential sources of support for making such sometimes costly acquisitions. And all this requires special knowledge and determination, as you can imagine, but I would also argue flair. PJ has these qualities in abundance. He was, I think, famously, perhaps most famously successful, at least early at this task, when the library acquired a 1507 edition of William Caxton's uh, The Golden Legend. Uh, it was a Caxton edition of The Golden Legend. Uh, which was a milestone as the oldest printed book in English in the library collection, important for that reason. But this particular copy is notable also for its intriguing alterations in the hand, in manuscript, in the hand of a, of a Reformation reader, alterations that would have attracted PJ because they are evidence of, you guessed it, censorship, which brings us to today's topic Stop the Presses, A Brief History of Literary Censorship in Canada. BJ. Thank you, Linda. That's a very kind introduction. Um, and uh, yes, certainly that is exactly what attracted me to, uh, to the collection, to that book was the censorship. Um, I, I, I approached the whole subject of uh, censorship very much from a librarian's point of view. I'm just gonna bring up my PowerPoint uh, slides and I'll just share my screen up there. Make sure you tell me that it, you can see it all right. Is that visible? Good. Okay. There we go. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I approach the whole subject of, of censorship from a librarian's point of view. I, I, I don't consider myself to be an expert. There are people that are true experts in censorship, but, um, but I've come to find it a fascinating topic over the uh, 20 years. It's hard to believe uh, that I've been at the library. Um, because I realized that there's a whole subsection to, to the library system. There are little, little collections all over the place, but one of the overarching um, subjects that touches almost every area of the books we collect is who has decided what you can and cannot read. And uh, I, I find that a, a very interesting entree into the collections in general. 
Um, so that's the context. I, I just want you to understand this, this approach to the, the history of literary censorship, uh, specifically in Canada. Um, I think there's lots of stuff, obviously, as Canadians that we are proud of. Uh, our healthcare system is the one that everyone always uh, um, acknowledges, uh, occasionally our hockey teams. But I think that one of the things that uh, we are most, that we are proudest of really as we travel all around the globe or watch news stories coming in from around the world is our democracy and, and the various freedoms that we associate with that. And chief among these, um, I would argue, is certainly the freedom of expression, which is protected, of course, by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And a system of jurisprudence that goes back hundreds of years, meaning that theoretically, I can write almost any bit of twaddle that enters my mind without and publish it without fear of incrimination, recrimination, I should say. I think that's something that we take for granted and it is very much the envy of uh, many who live in repression, uh, under repression in, in foreign lands. But that freedom that we enjoy is in fact not an absolute right. And the right to express ourselves is one which Canadians have in fact had to fight for over the past 400 years since Samuel Champlain first established uh, New France. So obviously today we can't look at every single aspect uh, of the evolution of the right to free expression, um, but as I say, as an academic librarian, it is an issue that is near and dear to my heart. And so for the next uh, few minutes, I'd just like to walk you through some of the high points and the low points of liter literary censorship and freedom as they have manifested themselves in Canada. First, just a few ground rules before uh, I really get going. The first thing to bear in mind is that when I speak of literary censorship, I am often using this as an umbrella term to mean three different things. And, and, and be very clear, I'm talking about print. Often people after the end of these, something like this will say, well, what about the movies? And, that's not my area remotely of expertise. So we're really talking about print. So the three aspects I want you to keep in mind are first of all that books, obviously, or magazines, print in general, can be banned, it can be censored, and it can be challenged. Those three areas, banned, censored, and challenged. Now banned means exactly what it sounds like. The, the, a book or printed uh, item is absolutely forbidden. Censored means, of course, that certain words or images are altered in order to allow the material to stay in public circulation. Challenged, however, refers to the efforts that are made to ban or censor a work uh, which is already in print. Now, today, the most common of those three is, in fact, the challenge. And there are a lot of challenges. We may, may not be aware of it, but there are a lot of challenges. Um, but the challenge generally doesn't go anywhere. Nevertheless, the intention behind the challenges is still to remove an item as it appears from public circulation. Now, the second thing I want you to bear in mind is that in Canada, there have generally been two focuses for our efforts at literary censorship. And so most of the case studies that I'm going to present to you have to do with one or other of these two things. Those two focuses are one, the effort to control vice, which is the most common, and second, the effort to combat sedition. So everything that we are going to look at in the next few minutes falls into one of those two categories. So without any further ado, let's look at how literary censorship has evolved and how it continues to evolve in Canadian society. Now, the very earliest incidents of actual censorship in what is now called Canada occurred in January of 1694. Now, at that time, Moliere's comedy, Tartuffe, which was by then about 30 years old, it was actually being performed in Quebec. Now, that's quite something when you consider that the town was really just the backwater of the French Empire at the time, but it obviously was one that had aspirations to cultural greatness already. Now, the play was being performed there actually under the patronage of the Comte de Frontenac, the governor. The problem was that the play, as you, some of you probably know, was about religious hypocrisy. And it had already been censored in France, thanks to the intervention of the Archbishop of Paris. So on the 16th of January in 1694, the Bishop of Quebec, Jean-Baptiste Saint-Vallier, citing French precedents, 
issued a condemnation of the play on the grounds that not only was it dangerous, but it actually was criminal. And to ensure that the play didn't circulate in print and that it would not be performed in the colony, the bishop offered Frontenac, who was terribly cash-strapped as governor, a hundred pistoles in return for banning the work completely, and the governor happily accepted. And thus the story of censorship in Canada appropriately begins with a comedy. Now, in the days before Confederation, and particularly before the establishment of responsible government after the rebellions of 1837, literary censorship most certainly focused on newspapers and rooting out the threat of sedition. Now, it's not surprising, perhaps, that the leaders of the rebellions, in particular, Ontario, what becomes in Ontario and Nova Scotia, were both printers. William Lyne Mackenzie, as I'm sure you all know, was the publisher of the radical Toronto newspaper, The Colonial Advocate, while Joseph Howe was the printer of the Nova Scotian. Both men at different times were accused of seditious libel for printing opinions that ran contrary to the political establishment of their day. They were not alone. The same charges had earlier already been brought against Joseph Wilcox, who was the publisher of the Upper Canadian Guardian as early as 1808. Francis Collins, the publisher of the Canadian Freeman, also charged with seditious libel in 1828, and several other printers of so-called radical newspapers at the beginning of the 19th century experienced the same thing. The aim was consistently the same, and it makes sense when you think about it. The government wanted to avoid Canada falling prey to the same radical views that had cost Britain her wealthiest colony when it lost the American Revolution a half century before this. But once responsible government had more or less been achieved in the years following the rebellions of 1837, but before Confederation, the regulation of print continued and actually diversified. Censorship in modern Canada, therefore, really and truly has its roots in the Customs Act, the Customs Act of 1847, because that act prohibited the importation of, quote, books and drawings of an immoral or an indecent character. Now, since then, jurisprudence has evolved based on that to take into account new situations and technologies, the internet, for example, with a view to combating sedition as well. The consistent difficulty for Canadians always has been, probably always will be, has been finding agreement amongst ourselves about what exactly constitutes an obscenity or what truly constitutes sedition in a way that takes into account the changing mores and the opinions of our society, especially in the 21st century. Now, since 1867, it has principally been customs agents, so the people at our borders, who've been the front line in the control of literature. But it was a customs tariff specifically that comes from the early 1930s, which really sets the stage for the contemporary battles between the government and bookstores over banned materials. That tariff, for example, from the early 1930s, it explicitly prohibited the importation of, quote, books, printed matter, drawings, painting, print, photographs, or any representation of any kind of a treasonable or seditious nature or of any immoral or indecent character. Now, because it was difficult for an individual customs agent who may not have been trained in any of these areas, left to their own devices to make a decision to be always certain about whether a particular item fell into one of these categories, lists were issued. And until 1958, these officials could turn to these lists of prescribed uh, uh, publications. These lists then supplemented the customs agent's own discretion when refusing to admit a book into the country. But, but bear in mind, that meant there was a lot of power in the hands of any individual customs agent. The very first list was actually issued in 1895, and it only contained 47 titles. But by 1957, it had well over a thousand titles prohibited from coming into the country. 
Now, even after the use of such lists was suspended, and eventually they do get suspended towards the end of the 20th century, customs agents still operated in accord with the spirit of those earliest tariff acts well into the 21st century, to which bookstores such as Little Sisters in Vancouver, Glad Day in Toronto, and Wonderworks as well, and Androgene in Montreal, they can all well attest. Just to give a few examples of some fairly typical examples, some books that you may be aware of or have read. Um, in 1988, the Grove Press of New York uh, published Kathy Acker's book, The Empire of the Senseless. If any of you have read it, it's written in stream of consciousness style. And Acker's book, it, it straddles a world that has one foot in the new Reagan era and another in what it believes would be the projected consequences. And so it has robots and humanoids who are the central characters in the tale. It's a very dark tale in which females are routinely abused, the marginalized have taken over the center, and all sexual relationships have become sadomasochistic. It's, it sounds obviously very familiar to The Handmaid's Tale as well. Acker's strong and, and some would argue vulgar language, which she maintained was necessary to attack the quote prisons of the postmodern world depends on the endurance of all sorts of taboos that we still hold today. Taboos that principally are concerned with sex or are with, uh, concerned with uh, biological functions. Now, some 200 copies of this title were actually imported into Canada without any incident whatsoever in October of 1988. But a further shipment was seized of the very same books by Canada Customs the following month, when it was on its way to Landregine, which happens to be a gay and lesbian bookstore in Montreal. The customs official at that time stated that Acker's book, quote, sensationalizes rape, incest, and buggery, which outweigh its merit as a novel. That was the customs agent's decision by himself. The bookstore proprietor, who had actually ordered that shipment of books, reported this to the CBC and said, well, the very same thing could be said of the Old Testament. Not surprisingly, the books were released on the very, very same day that he gave that interview to the CBC. Now, Canadian author, Jane Rule, who is the author of The Young and One in Another's Arms, that book was published in New York by Doubleday in 1977. It is written against the backdrop of Canadian and American relations uh, during the uh, Vietnam War, and in it, Rule explores the interactions of men and women with one another. Some of them are sexual, some are platonic, some are straight, some are gay. Underlying her narrative, however, is the understanding that, I think the right understanding, that within all relationships, there is also power. And power can be used, and it can be abused. And that's what the story talks about. Now, in 1978, her book won the Canadian Authors Association Award for the best novel of that same year. 12 years later, 1990, it was seized by Canada Customs as obscene literature. Now, rules books are regularly imported into Canada, still are, but they only seem to encounter difficulty getting into the country if their destination happened to be a gay or lesbian bookstore like Little Sisters in Vancouver or Glad Day in Toronto. And so Rule, she went and testified at the trial that ensued with that, uh, when uh, obscenity charges were brought against Little Sisters store in 1994. And Rule reflected on this experience. And she said, quote, every time this issue comes up, whether I were testifying in this trial or not, my name would come up over and over again as that woman whose books are seized at the border and I have absolutely no defense against it. And I bitterly resent the attempt to marginalize, trivialize, and even criminalize what I have to say just because I happen to be a lesbian. I happen to be a novelist. I happen to have bookstores and publishers who are dedicated to producing my work. The assumption that there must be something pornographic in my writing because of my sexual orientation is a shocking way to deal with my community. Now, the fact is, however, that things have finally started to improve somewhat in Canada in the 21st century with regards to the banning and censoring of materials that are printed abroad. 
Now, in fact, it is far more difficult for any, any individual customs agent to act on his or her own initiative. In the year 2000, the Supreme Court of Canada provided a decision that evened the playing field at least a little bit. Now, it's important that, to realize that the, the, the decision actually upheld the right of Canada customs agents to inspect and seize sexually obscene materials. But at the very same time, it criticized the agency for clearly focusing on materials that had gay and lesbian themes, especially when they were being imported by gay and lesbian booksellers. The court also judged that customs agents could only now confiscate materials that had been specifically ruled by the courts to con constitute an offense under the Criminal Code of Canada. So that means now that no customs agent can operate solely solely on his or her own discretion. That then nicely segues into the next part of my talk. Now, as I've been saying, historically, it's customs agents, obviously, who could seize books coming into the country. They are the only people that could seize books coming into the country. So what does that mean then for publications that were made in the country? How do you deal with a publication of literature, literary material that is domestically produced? Well, as I just alluded, that is left to the Criminal Code of Canada. It's for that code to regulate domestic publication uh, practices. But for the most part, it has only been during periods of severe political or social crisis that Canadian governments have chosen actively to pursue a genuine policy of censorship. In less tumultuous periods, the code has generally played a supporting role, helping to prop up vague notions of community standards, which like the definition of, uh, of uh, obscenity and sedition I mentioned earlier, is not always an easy concept to make sense of or to apply. Let's turn back 100 years then and see a more typical way in which the criminal code has dealt with issues of censorship. With the threat to the British Empire abroad and domestic security at home, the First World War provoked unprecedented levels of censorship on the Canadian home front, as well, of course, as on the battlefield. The War Measures Act of 1914 provided for the censorship and control and suppression of publications, writings, maps, plans, photographs, communication, and means of communications. If you recall, that sounds very similar to that original tariff act back from the 1840s. The most severe ban was issued at the time by Canada's chief censor, Ernest J. Chambers, who you see there looking rather dapper on, on the right, uh, who formally excluded 253 foreign titles, but he also suppressed several Canadian newspapers during the First World War, including the Sault Ste. Marie Express, Le Bulletin of Montreal, Quebec City's La Croix, and Victoria Week, which had the temerity to question the government's wartime policies at the time. Now, after the armistice was signed on the 11th of November, 1918, easy access to economic and political information did not rapidly improve in Canada. And the reason, labor unrest. It was labor unrest here at home with the return of Canadian soldiers from abroad combined with the fear of the excesses of the Russian revolution, which we must recall was a very recent memory for the government of the day. So as a result, fear of socialism pervaded the corridors of power, not only in Ottawa, but also in all of the provincial capitals. The chief censor, therefore, actually obtained an extension of the War Measures Act to the end of 1919, ostensibly at least, to allow for the reconstruction of the faltering Canadian economy. As a result, numerous leftist books and journals were not surprisingly banned from importation. But in addition, some more mainstream Canadian journals were also suppressed in 1918 and 1919, the two most noteworthy being the Western Clarion and the Red Flag. And as you can see, I'm putting the call numbers up. These are all items that you can find in the Fisher's holdings. The chief censor, however, was much less successful in prosecuting organizations that were willing to print materials inside the country. In 1919, for example, the Socialist Party of Canada published an edition of the Communist Manifesto, I think a rather beautiful one, 
uh, using funds that had been bequeathed to them by the late Communist Party member George Whitehead of Vancouver. Now, very cl cleverly, the cover of this publication, the first one printed in Canada of the Communist Manifesto that you see here, bears a poppy on it. An emotional reminder to the ordinary reader of what the youth of Canada had suffered in the Great War, begging the question, to what end? And so, to get around this loophole, especially in the wake of the Winnipeg strike in May of 1919, combined with general worker discontent across Canada, the Canadian government added Section 98 to the Criminal Code of Canada, establishing a 20-year prison term for anyone who was involved in the production or the distribution or sale of printed materials that advocated or defended the use of force or terrorism to achieve a political or economic change. The problem with this, obviously, was that it could be interpreted quite generously if the need arose, and it did. In the period between the wars, while, as I've mentioned, Canadian customs were refusing the entry of magazines and books declared obscene, provincial bureaucrats were focusing their attention on domestically printed materials that appeared to threaten the social and political order within their respective jurisdictions. At Quebec, in Quebec, the government of the infamous Maurice Duplessis passed the notorious Padlock Law in 1937, which made it illegal, illegal to propagate communism in print in Canada, in Quebec, I should say. According to this new law, prosecutors were given the right to close down printing houses and imprison persons suspected of printing or disseminating what they determined were communist ideas. The government in this enjoyed the blessing of the Catholic Church, which as we, we've said, we saw at the beginning, has traditionally served or had traditionally served as the de facto censor in the province of Quebec up to that time. Now, as we have already seen is so often the case with censorship legislation, the law itself did not define propagation. What is it to propagate communism? And given the perceived threat to Canadian society coming from this emerging and admittedly growing socialist movement, the federal government in Ottawa decided not to challenge Quebec's uh, actions. That law, the padlock law, remained in force in Quebec until 1957, when it was finally struck down by the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, less successful were the efforts of Alberta's social uh, credit government, which attempted to restrict the freedom of the press through a series of increasingly draconian actions between the years 1935 and 1937. In 1937, the government passed the Alberta Press Act, requiring newspapers to publish free of charge statements furnished by the social credit board chairman that related to government policies. Now in an Orwellian twist, part of this act bore the name, the Accurate News and Information Act, and the act required editors to print up to one full page of official party text every day a newspaper was printed if needed by the Socreds. That doesn't sound too terribly different from Pravda. The act also demanded that newspapers divulge the names of anyone involved in the writing of editorials for them. Penalties for the violation of the act's articles included the suspension of publication of newspapers and journals, as well as bans against journalists personally. Well, not surprisingly, the act was challenged almost immediately. And in March of 1938, the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously declared it to be unconstitutional. The issue of freedom of the press in Alberta received international attention. And as a result, for their defense of the rights of the press, the Edmonton Journal was actually awarded a special Pulitzer Prize. Now, as you might expect, the revival of hostilities in Europe in 1939 saw a return to more stringent and regular censorship in Canada. Domestic censorship was initially voluntary, meaning that newspapers and, and book editors were charged to act as censors themselves within their own domains in accordance with the Articles of the War Measures Act and the Defense of Canada regulations that came into effect in September of 1939. Now, as with the First World War, true censorship understandably focused on the protection of military secrets, national safety, 
and the prosecution of the war abroad, which makes sense, but also to maintain morale at home. Now, contrary to our normal common law tradition, the burden of proof now fell on the person who was charged with any violation of the regulations. That means the presumption of innocence during the Second World War was not the norm in cases where there had been a violation of the War Measures Act. Now, although the chief censor of the Dominion was empowered to say what did not infringe the regulations, he was never actually required to state positively that the publication of a particular story was a violation. So you can see this becomes a very gray area. And so it's not surprising that this led to a lot of confusion among journalists, especially when reporting on troop deployment and communicating basic logistical information. As the Second World War progressed, however, the censor's office did become more specific in its instructions. And given the sensitivity of the information they dealt with on a daily basis, the fact is that most journalists were both sympathetic and willingly compliant. At the war's peak, however, some 600 publications across the country were still in fact banned by the government in Ottawa. With the conclusion of the Second War, the active censorship of materials ceased for the most part of, of seditious material. And in the 1950s and 60s, the, the period we start to move away from sedition back to material that might be considered to be obscene. However, then came a moment that I'm sure we all remember quite well, an event that pushed the issue of sedition back onto the front burner, and that was the October crisis of 1970. Those catastrophic days were the very last time to date that freedom of expression was actually curtailed in Canada in response to a national emergency. Prime Minister Trudeau invoked the War Measures Act, obviously last used in the 1940s, to deal with the perceived threat that the Front de Libération de Québec, the FLQ, posed to Canada's peace and security in general and to Quebec in particular. Now, you may recall that the act limited the ability of both local and national newspapers and magazines to report on the events of the day. And there was surprisingly little criticism at the time, even though this act allowed for, quote, the censorship and the control and the suppression of publications, writings, maps, plans, communication, and means of communication. It was a very, very broad ban. Although there were sporadic protests against invoking, invoking the act at the time, both in English and French Canada, it was not until after the crisis was over and relative calm prevailed again that Trudeau's government was widely criticized for exercising so ham-fisted and wide-sweeping control of print media during a domestic crisis when people should know what was going on, at least as much as possible. As a result, the War Measures Act was actually replaced in 1988 by the Emergencies Act. And you may well know that because we've heard about it several times during the past year about whether the government would invoke the Emergencies Act during the current uh, health crisis. But the new Emergencies Act makes absolutely no mention of censorship. I would suspect that should a time of national emergency arise again, the government would still be able to assume temporary powers to control the dissemination of information that might run contrary to public security, but let's hope we're never going to find that out. Now, bear in mind that in 1949, of the 126 titles banned from Canada, only 29 were considered seditious. The rest were deemed to be obscene. And although the Canadian provincial governments were the driving forces behind censorship during times of real or imagined danger to the country, at other times, most often, governments have used other agencies besides Canada Customs to enforce their will. Government ministers have done it, the courts have done it, school boards have done it, for example, to help fight the perceived threats to community standards of the day, especially with reference to allegedly obscene materials. So just a few examples will help illustrate the point that continues to be a vexing one for authors and publishers and booksellers down to the present day. Many of you, I am sure, have read Norman Mailer's greatest book, The Naked and the Dead. Miller actually claimed in his 1959 omnibus collection, Advertisements for Myself, that he only actually joined the military so that he could write the World War II novel, an enterprise at which 
Many critics claim he succeeded in this, his very first literary effort. His frank depiction of the war in the Philippines shattered many of the heroic illusions traditionally associated with military life. His prose is shockingly realistic, especially for the time, using obscenities that would become a regular feature of all of his later writing, especially he maintained, expressing he maintained the humanity of America. Now, after 10 weeks on the bestsellers list, in February of 1949, the book that the Globe and Mail described as pure pornography was banned from all of the country's bookstores and libraries by the Canadian Minister of National Reve Revenue, J.J. McCann, into whose purview fell the right to import or prohibit foreign literature. But like many censors before him, the minister admitted that he had never actually read the book. Instead, he based his judgment on the highlighted bits that his staff had deemed to be salacious, and then he condemned the work as disgusting and removed it from the shelves of the nation. Provincial courts had subsequently issued rulings that make this more difficult, though no, not impossible, to ban books on the basis of proof texting. That is, reading the naughty bits and pieces out of context, and on the basis of that reading, then banning a text. Another title that many of you may have read away from the prying eyes of parents and teachers was D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. Originally entitled Tenderness, this tale even offended Lawrence's typist, who refused to work with the text. So to complete the typescript, it became necessary to engage Maria Huxley, who was Aldous Huxley's wife. The book was banned in Ireland and Poland in 1932, and in 1944, it was seized from the offices of the Dial Press in New York City. The book did make its way to bookshelves in Canada, but as many of you will recall, in a very, very heavily expurgated form. When the original uncensored text finally did appear in Britain and Canada in 1960, it was immediately banned by the Canadian Sessions judge T.A. Fontaine of Montreal, who pronounced the work obscene. In his judgment, he set aside the expert testimony of both Hugh McLennan and Morley Callahan, declaring their interventions to be purely personal opinion as though his wasn't. The following year, Canada Customs, it even held up the importation of the newspaper reports on the British trial that was going on of the book because of the explicit details the reports themselves contained. In 1962, the Supreme Court of Canada finally ruled that the work was not obscene and allowed it for sale, but in 1964, the book was once again condemned here in Ontario, throwing the case back to the Supreme Court, which finally did dismiss the case, but believe it or not, in a very close decision, it was a five to four judgment. Community standards, whatever that means, still remains a strong court of appeal for book challengers and book banners. Nowhere has this been the case, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, as the opposition to publications issued by the gay and lesbian community. One such case you may recall from some years ago was The Body Politic, one of the most influential newspapers in the Canadian gay and lesbian history, printed in Toronto between 1971 and 1987. It was inspired by the frustration that uh, gays and lesbians experience, both in dealing with mainstream media and also political inaction uh, after the Stonewall riots of 1969. At that time, Gerald Moldenauer then assembled something called the Body Politic Editorial Collective. He's donated his books to us at the Fisher. Its aim was to publish articles that reflected life in the local gay community, but they were also directed at encouraging debate in the larger community. Now, not surprisingly, the newspaper offended many municipal officials by challenging contemporary mores on sexuality and youth, prostitution, casual sex, violence against homosexuals, and censorship itself. On several occasions during the 1970s, the Toronto Star refused to print advertisements for the paper. And in 1973, Newsweb Enterprises, a subsidiary of the Star, refused to print the paper at all, which it had been doing. Two years later, the police raided the body politic offices on Carlton Street, threatening to remove the May issue from newsstands because of a sexually explicit cartoon. In 
It was Gerald Hannon's 1977 controversial, very controversial article, Men Loving Boys Loving Men, however, that incurred the wrath of the police and courts more than any other. The newspaper was charged under section 164 of the criminal codes use of the mails to distribute immoral, indecent or scurrilous material, but it was acquitted in 1979 and it was acquitted again in 1982. As recently as 2003, however, Hannon still found himself in court for writing that article, defending his almost quarter century old words yet again. Despite court rulings to the contrary, many groups still resort to proof texting when trying to ban books, as well as the authors associated with them. Parent groups have especially availed themselves of this tactic since the 1970s, as they have sought greater control over student reading lists in the public school system. Perhaps the most famous incident, saddest incident, I would say, occurred in 19, 1976 over Margaret Lawrence's great novel, The Diviners, first published in Toronto two years earlier. The book, which describes a middle-aged woman coming to terms with the fragility of her own life, was deemed pornographic by some school officials. The, principals, the principal of Lawrence's local high school near Peterborough initially removed the book from the grade 13 Canadian literature curriculum and relegated the book to the library so that students would not have to read what some people thought might be offensive. The majority of students, however, seem to take a much more mature view of the book than their elders. Quote, it deals with subjects that we as pupils have dealt with already in life and now are trying to understand, said one student, whose testimony was among that of many given before the Board of Education. Certain religious groups from Peterborough, however, united under the banner of the Citizens in Defense of Decency, demanded that the work be struck from the curriculum of the entire local school district on the grounds that it was unsavory pornography, promoting degradation, indecency, and immorality. Now, although their demands were ultimately rejected, the book was challenged again before the very same board in 1985 by another group of fundamentalists who acknowledged that they had not actually read the book. One person writing to the Peterborough Examiner asserted that, quote, we know that Margaret Lawrence's aim in life is to destroy the home and the family, a charge that baffled and shocked Lawrence herself, who was in fact the mother of two. She confided to friends that were she to respond to these accusations in any, any literary manner, she feared that her art would be compromised and any veiled references to the experience would only be perceived as petty revenge. Her book still remains among the most controversial titles found in secondary school curricula and periodically continues to be challenged along with her other previous masterpieces, The Stone Angel and A Jest of God. Now, although Lawrence enjoyed a faithful readership throughout this controversy, sadly, she never wrote another novel again after this. The book banners in her case Thereby, thereby did enjoy some measure of success. Similar complaints, believe it or not, were raised by parent councils across the country against Morley Callahan's Such Is My Beloved, which was originally published in 1934. Set in downtown Toronto during the Depression and considered by many to be Callahan's masterpiece, this story concentrates on the efforts of a young Catholic priest to help two impoverished prostitutes overcome the futility of their tragic lives owing in part to its very realistic depiction on, of life on Toronto's dirty streets, it enjoyed great success in Canada from the time of its first printing. For many years, however, Callahan's novel was restricted to the so-called art room at the University of Toronto in the company of other su suspect authors such as the Marquis de Sade and James Joyce. To gain access to such restricted materials in the art room, at the university during the 1940s and 50s, students had to affirm that they were free of mental problems before they could get it. And even as late as 1972, two Protestant ministers in Muskoka sought to have the title removed from the Huntsville High School because of its pro uh, depiction of prostitution and the use of swearing, with which, of course, the students in Huntsville were completely unfamiliar. The book and Periodical Council of Canada, as you probably know, annual, annually sponsors Freedom to Read Week 
usually in the last week of February, in an effort to remind people that even in our very enlightened, very democratic society, challenges to our ability to read what we want still regularly occur in this country. Among the books still re repeatedly challenged in Canada, particularly on high school reading lists, are such titles as A Clockwork Orange, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, To Kill a Mockingbird, Lives of Girls and Women, Who Has Seen the Wind, Of Mice and Men, and Snow Falling on Cedars. Many years ago, when I was teaching high school English at the Etobicoke School of the Arts, we in the English department would sit down at the beginning of each September to go over which novels we would read that year with our students. I remember on one occasion, the discussion came around to this book, Like Water for Chocolate, which we've been teaching regularly for some five years or so. The head of the department suggested that we should just retire it for this year, which surprised some of the staff since the book had been really popular both with students and teachers alike. And believe me, that is no small thing in high school. When we asked why, we were reluctantly told that one or two parents had been concerned with some of the sexual content in the book, and it might just be easier if we let the novel drop by the wayside. I have learned from other high school teachers since that our experience at ESA was not at all that unusual. In order to avoid controversy, principals and department heads do sometimes choose the path of least resistance and effectively serve as censors rather than take on an issue that could become a problem for everyone involved. While this in one sense seems perfectly understandable as an approach to the problem, it certainly sends the wrong message, I believe, in a democracy. I continue to believe that we do our students no service by removing from curricula books that touch on sensitive but age appropriate topics. Teenagers are well aware of sex, perhaps much more than we would like them to be, but surely to remove the discussion of sexuality from the classroom, for example, where it can be explored under the supervision of an adult and within the context of great literature and, rather, and relegate it instead to the schoolyard where idle chatter is going to happen anyway, but unsupervised, surely that provides no service to anyone. The same can be said for many other penetrating and difficult subjects that are the stuff of great literature, poverty, economic polarities in society, prejudice, mental suffering, physical addictions. These are the realities that our students live with here in Canada every single day. By reading good literature, perhaps controversial literature, but good literature, they can catch a reflection of their own reality shining back at them, helping them make sense of themselves and the world around them, and perhaps most importantly, helping them to realize that they are not alone. Way back in 1978, The Observer published an article entitled Censorship, Your Obscenity or Mine, which I think sums up the problem beautifully. It writes, students need to be helped to develop a sense of moral responsibility for their actions, including their reading habits. True education is the cruel, difficult, slow process of learning to observe, feel, touch, think for yourself. It involves being aware of, of opposing viewpoints, rejecting some, testing others, and in the process, evolving something that is all your own. This can't happen if some points of view are decla declared out of bounds from the beginning. So how do things stand today? Well, challenges to literature still continue at rather impressive rates for a democratic society. You can track them at the websites of the American Library Association and Freedom to Read Week if you're interested. Some are quite serious and can involve complicated issues. Others seem quite trivial by comparison. Margaret Atwood has long been a champion of freedom of expression in Canada. This was particularly evident in 1987 and 88 when she opposed the passage of Bill C-54 which would have defined pornography to include depictions of intercourse between consenting adults. The burden of proof would have been on the accused author. Her Handmaid's Tale has proven to be a lightning rod. In 2008, a parent from Toronto's Lawrence Park Collegiate complained that the dystopian novel used profane language, had anti-Christian overtones, used excessive violence and sexual degra degradation all of which they maintained violated the school board's policy requiring students to show respect and tolerance towards one another. 
After due consideration, a review, a review panel from the Toronto District School Board recommended that schools keep the novel in the curriculum in the grade 11 and 12 for grade 11 and 12 students. But the challenges keep happening every single year against this book. In May of 2014, the Kamloops School District was asked to ban Stephen Shkofsky's coming of age tale, The Perks of Being a Wallflower from the high school curriculum because of its sexual content. The board reviewed the text with the committee of parents and teachers, and the book remains in the classroom though an appeal has been lodged. The same year, the Toronto Public Library was asked to ban Dr. Seuss's Hop on Pop because some people felt it was just too violent. The unnamed complainant asked that the book be removed from the public library collection and that the Toronto Public Library, quote, issue an apology to fathers in the GTA and pay for damages resulting from this book. It seems that parents in both cases feel very strongly about the literature their children read, which is understandable, though some probably have greater grounds for concerns than others. But back to the salient point. There may indeed be times such as war and civil unrest when governments and communities might feel the need to restrict access to reading material, but surely those occasions should be very few and very far between. Those who cannot defend themselves or advocate on their own behalf, the handicapped and children most obviously, must always be protected by the law so that they are not exposed to harm, manipulation and abuse in print media. But I believe that most of us are capable of fighting our own battles and acting on our own behalf. The fact is that no one in Canada has ever said, I think this book should be banned because it will have a negative effect on the way that I think. Books are always challenged by those who think that they know better than their neighbors and are supposedly protecting their best interests. At its core, censorship is paternalistic and insulting. It is based on the exercise of authority rather than on reasoned argument. And I believe, as I was taught in graduate school, the argument from authority is always the weakest. It presumes either that I cannot handle controversial material or that I cannot teach my children how to read it. And as I've tried to indicate, it is generally a futile exercise. Banning or censoring a book is the surest way to make it a bestseller. What we need is literature, sometimes controversial literature, to help us teach our kids, teach one another how to read critically so that we can distinguish between what has been edited and what hasn't been edited, between truth and lies. But you need the literature there in order to do that in the first place. And this situation, as we are all too well aware, is becoming even more futile as the internet makes censorship almost impossible. Ironically, the internet is now forcing us to have the conversations we should have been having decades ago with our children, our spouse, our governments, our employees, our coworkers about what is appropriate for reading and viewing and what is not, what is real and what is fake and how to tell the difference when in the past we would simply just have issued a ban. Choosing what to read often involves a moral choice, but it is precisely our choice, not someone else's. It should involve thought and discussion, and as history demonstrates, that process cannot and should not in the end be short-circuited by the simple flexing of authoritative muscle on our behalf. So ask yourself this question, what would my world look like today if the censors had actually succeeded and the books that I have mentioned and the countless others in our libraries and bookstores and news agents had been destroyed or never published at all? Your answer, I would hope, would be the same as that of George Bernard Shaw who said, censorship ends in logical completeness when nobody is allowed to read any books except the books that nobody reads. <laughs>